Да? И така, а, може би трябва вече да дадем, да отстъпим сцената а, на Мари Гидбуб. А, Гудбуб. Sorry. А, а, Мари е журналист от а, Берлин, от а, много години се занимава с а, организиране на криптопартита и а, обучението на журналисти а, за сибер, а, киберсигурност. А, сега тя ще ни разкаже малко повече за а, това как а, това се отразява на вашия живот реално. А, и така, нека приветстваме Мари на сцената. Hi everyone, it's really, really great to be back here in Sofia. My talk was actually the a few years ago, so it's really special for me to be here. Um, so nice to see how it's grown since the first time I came here. Um, my name is Marie, um, I go by Sher Marie on Twitter. Um, I'm a privacy advocate, um, I used to work as a journalist, that's why I'm still presented as a journalist, I guess. Um, an InfoSec trainer, a campaigner and community Organizer. Um, I've worked um, among others with the Center for Journalism, um, the Courage Foundation, TOR Project, um, and Probo. This better? Okay. I'll just get rid of this. Yeah, so um, I've also been doing a lot of work with Crypto Party, mostly in Berlin, but also um, pretty much everywhere in Europe. Um, and this is basically a collection of thoughts, experiences, comments, etc., that I've collected over a few years doing Crypto Party and training journalists. So, 10-ish years ago, pretty much nobody cared about encryption. Of course, there was the cypherpunks and like there was people writing crypto and everything, but the general public really, really didn't know what it was. Like, I had never heard of it. And then something happened. This guy, Edward Snowden, revealed a bunch of NSA um, surveillance programs to the world. And the news was pretty much everywhere in the newspapers, on TV, and even at the Oscars ceremony. And some people who had no background knowledge in surveillance in computer sci science or anything related, um, they started to be really, really angry and started to get it, getting interested in um, how to protect themselves, how to protect them da their data. Um, that was not everyone, but it was fair amounts of people. And that's why at Crypto Party, we started uh, partying like it's 1984. Um, Crypto Party, that's where it's grew. Um, of course, there was Crypto Party before, but that's where people really started organizing a lot. You can look on the website, you have all the past dates, and you really see there is a big change in how many Crypto Party organized around that time. Um, if you don't know, Crypto Party is a decentralized global initiative. Um, basically, we introduce um, very basic tools for protecting privacy, anonymity, and overall security on the internet and the, to the general public. Um, the idea was conceived in Australia in the wake of the Australian Cyber Crime Legislation Amendment Bill in 2011. There was, at the beginning, a woman who was called Asher Wolf who started this. And she was not a techie, and the reasoning was that laws like this are without substance. 
and when every uh, when everybody encrypts their communication. And what people at Crypto Party do is basically that they gather around a bunch of tables. Um, it's very informal. Some people do talks. I don't really like it. And we install um, software for email encryption, like um, PGP or GPG. Um, we use Signal for like encrypted messaging, Tor. We encrypt um, hard drives. We maybe even teach people how to install Linux if they want to switch to open source. Um, and these events are mostly great fun. It ends up with beer and like it's very very um, easy way and cheap. It's for free to just go and bring your computer and learn something interesting. But people get bored of things, and there is a new cycle, and there are thousands of things happening in the world. Um, there is Trunks and Trump, and there is the hurricane, like Harvey, Harvey and Ar Irma, and there is problems in Korea, and there is always news, and people are really busy with their own lives, and they can't really follow this whole news cycle. So Snowden, he's kind of forgotten by now. Like we recognize him if we see a picture, but no one's actually like, today I'm going to do something about surveillance because of Snowden, and there have no reminders in the news, or pretty much no reminders, so they forgot. Um, I haven't seen a big publication of Snowden Docs recently, by the way, there is still a bunch out there that should be published. Um, but there is no reminders. Um, and still there is a thousand reasons to encrypt. There is state surveillance, corporate surveillance, our right to privacy, data retention, and none of, none of these issues have been solved. Um, and we need to find a ways, or several ways, to make people understand why they would actually need to encrypt their data and care. So what we do is, this is what it looks like when we try to make people care about privacy. We make a flyer like this, which obviously not a lot of people will pick up because it looks kind of boring and it's black and white and it looks a little bit complicated and too techy for normal people which is the target audience of a crypto party. This is an actual crypto party flyer. Um, or worse, we just publish the date on a wiki and we hope someone will show up. And we invite people in mostly such a location, which like, is not exactly what they're used to in the hacker space, which can be scary for a lot of people. This is in Berlin where we organize some of our crypto parties, um, that's Seabase. Or this is what it would look like here. I love Initlab, nothing against it, but that's, again, a hackerspace. And we teach something that looks like this. Now, some people are not that extreme at crypto parties um, and don't do common line stuff, but I've been taught stuff like this at the first crypto party I attended, and I was told there was no other solution. So this, I've seen ha this happen a lot. And when we try to teach people this, we're forgetting that um, most of people communicate like this, which is kind of different from this, and, or even like this. And that's our target audience, and we come with this. Um, and then we wonder why it's not working and why people don't want to use our tools. And then people come with like, I have nothing to hide. <laughs> I found this picture a few days ago on Twitter and the guy who tweeted it said, this is the new symbol picture for nothing to hide. And I kind of agreed. Thanks to that guy, I don't remember who it is. Um, and they say they're already doing their best um, to protect themselves. Um, I'll let you read this confidentiality notice. So. Basically, you get what it is. It's someone who writes, this email is private, so don't read it, don't intercept it, and don't use it if you're not supposed to read it. Um, I get a lot of emails like this, and um, this one is actually from the Podesta leaks from WikiLeaks, so it's actually an email from the Clinton campaign. And I don't know about you, but every time I see an email like this, I just want to bang my head on, head on my desk. Or people also say, I encrypt, I use WhatsApp. Um, they don't really think about what that means and who owns WhatsApp, maybe some guy who's not got really good intentions. 
which mostly ends up with some mansplaining from some crypto party dude about how proprietary software cannot be trusted and about how Zuckerberg cannot be trusted. And we kind of sound a little bit like Stallman when we do this. And it's actually so bad that you know who's better than us? BuzzFeed. Um, I don't know if you know what BuzzFeed is. It's this massive uh, US media corporation um, that has like a lot of local newspapers. They have France, Germany, Japan, Brazil. It's like they have quite a lot of readers and um, most of the journalism they do is stuff like um, stuff about Taylor Swift. They love Taylor Swift. Um, or this kind of content. Order a taco and build a hot guy and we'll reveal a deep truth about you. Like great hardcore journalism. So I was pretty surprised a few months ago when I found this on their front page. It's easy to fall for email phishing scams. Here's how to protect yourself. Now this is really basic, but this is also adapted to the audience that Crypto Party is addressing. And normally BuzzFeed is not exactly famous for good tech journalism. It's more like how to make your iPhone look fancy than actual tech stuff. Um, and it's pretty expected, unexpected to see this between build a smoothie bowl and we'll reveal your age and college major and some bullshit about Pippa Middleton's wedding. And in the article you find this. Um, it's a pretty decent explanation about how to identify what's called a sketchy email. And um, of course it's ve very basic, of course it's very short and it's far from being perfect. There's a lot of additional advice that could be given um, but this is a great way to start if you have no idea what a phishing email could look like. Um, if you need better videos, I can give you some advice about that, but it's, it's a start. Um, and this message will reach a lot of people because BuzzFeed has a huge audience and probably help some. Um, they talk about uh, the domain of the sender's email address, uh, the phrasing of the subject line, the content, the typos, uh, punctuation, attachments. I'm really not trying to advertise for BuzzFeed. I actually hate BuzzFeed. Um, but this is a pretty good start. And they're not the only one. Like, BuzzFeed is not an exception. This is Teen Vogue from a year ago. And they've done one too. I would, I think, even some interviews by, uh, with some pretty good crypto people in there. And this is how a crypto party tries to teach stuff. Um, and it probably works a little bit less good when you just have such a list with links. And even worse, this. So uh, this website is, uh, these websites are outdated. They're too complicated. Um, there are sometimes even wikis which are not really appealing to a general audience who is used to Snapchat and Instagram. And this is how we'll think we'll manage to get people to use crypto tools. Of course, there is better tools. Um, there is tools that are built by organizations that know and understand how to communicate. Some efforts have been done. A good example is uh, Signal from Open Whisper Systems. I'm not a big fan of Signal, but, and there is a lot of things that could have been said about it, but in the end, it's a tool for encrypted messaging and calls on smartphones and desktop that are easy to install, understand, and use. And I've gotten a bunch of people who had no idea about tech to just use Signal and encrypt their messages with me, which is very helpful. Now, I've shown this already last time. At, I was at OpenFest, but it was a much smaller room, and I think it's still the best symbol and um, about how we fail at communicating stuff. So I'll share it again. In most case, uh, this is what a beginner has to deal when they want to try to use some crypto tools. Uh, this is the website of OTR, of the record encryption. Um, it's basically to encrypt your chats. And if you want to seriously encrypt your chats, it's still state of the tools that people would re recommend at a crypto party. Um, it has strong encryption, and I'm not going to go into details because this is not a talk about how encryption works. And it's far from being the most complicated tool to use. I've gotten my grandma to use it. Um, she thinks it's the new version of MSN, but it's doable. Um, and 
It's actually pretty simple compared to email encryption, for example. Um, but this website will not help spreading it. If you don't know OTR and you magically find this because it's already a pretty hard to find website because you need to know the name of the plugin. Um, and if you don't know anything about computers, this won't really help you. First, here you can see an attempt to explain how it works. The two first points uh, about encryption and authentication, I think, are pretty understandable. Um, but then just forget about it. Um, digital signatures that are checkable by a third party, which beginner understands that? Um, same for private keys. Like, when you want to get started with encryption, I remember when I started it, I had someone explain me what a private and a public key are, and this website will not help you. Um, what percentage of the population knows the word private key? You might know it because you're at a tech conference, but we're talking about a lot of different people. Um, and this website was probably written in the hope it would spread and help people. I hope it was not only written for a few nerds, because that would be weird to make such a tool and hope it would only be used by a few nerds. Some tools do that. Um, so let's assume someone recommended the tool, so you're not going to try to understand why you should do, use it, so you can skip the first paragraph, and you'll just try to download it. This is what you can see under download. Um, most people use Pigeon or Adium when they want to use OTR. There is no mention of Adium. So basically, if you are, you're on a, a Mac user, you're already excluded by this website. And um, forget about Linux. This is just for Windows. Um, also, it's just for the plugin, so you need to understand that you'd have to also um, install Pigeon separately, and this is only a plugin. Um, and if you're a Windows or Linux user and you go for um, Pigeon, um, the struggle continues once the installation is done. You need to find out by yourself that you should actually activate the OTR plugin um, manually in the list of plugins, so you need to find the list of plugins, and then mostly it's not called OTR, it's called off-the-record messaging, so you actually need to know that. And then you need to um, activate this. Only then you'll be able to generate a key if you understand what that means, and start once more manually by clicking on the words um, not private um, at your encrypted conversation. That's not very intuitive. By the way, don't try to add this Jabber account. It's not my real one. It's just for the example. Um, so how is the button that's supposed to start a pri private conversation called not private? And then you might be safe. If you, um, if you manage to check your fingerprints with your communication partners and understand what that means, and if you never forget to start OTR when you start a conversation, because if you forget, not only your conversation won't be encrypted, but Pigeon by default keeps logs, um, which is also a great thing. Um, this is not what we call privacy by design. And then I thought it got better, because OTR got a new website. And it has a little bit more information. It was a good surprise, and it looks a little bit more modern. Um, and there is some better information about OTR on the website if you scroll down. Um, but it also has this link, um, get to know the OTR protocol, and when you click on it, this happens. Um, back to the old shitty page. So the new page is basically just a shell around the old page. Um, the user pain level in these cases is very high. And I'm not even talking about PGP, because that would take me two hours. And I'm not giving you um, examples of how someone would figure that out. And even BuzzFeed makes fun of us. Um, this article, you probably can't encrypt anything, can you? It's about how encryption tools are too hard to use. It was about a study. And it was published years before BuzzFeed actually started trying to teach. But they're already f making fun of us in a post known face. I think this is 2015. And don't get me wrong. BuzzFeed is not some kind of hero. Um, exactly as a providential leak like what Snowden did, doesn't happen every day. Um, the effect 
Buzz, that BuzzFeed gets suddenly interested in crypto instead of cute cats and Taylor Swift's outfit and the 10 new unicorn gadget you should buy on Amazon is not because they really care. It's probably just a short-term effect of Trump's election where people started using Signal in, Tor in the US a lot more. And um, I think the Signal user base grew a lot. There was some data about that. And it's some effect where the US left, -ish, US left media and decided to be activists. Um, like there was no reason to encrypt before and probably will ga go back to not caring like there is no reason to encrypt after Trump. Of course, BuzzFeed's not the only one. There is stuff like The Intercepts that have some good articles about how to encrypt. But to be honest, who reads The Intercept except for people who are already interested in these kind of topics? And then there is, of course, what I talked about at my first talk at OpenFest, which is art, mu music, movies as vectors, cultural vectors of uh, political messages, um, which is a great thing, but again, is not happening enough to get masses to care. There is some good movies. There is a movie about Snowden, um, but it's not enough. Um, so this brings us back to what are we relying to get people to understand how much privacy matters? And then we call mostly the crypto party guys because there is nothing else. And the problem on the technical level, I know there is a lot of other levels, political, social, and so on, um, is that the tools that provide good end-to-end -end encryption are too complicated, as we saw. And whoever isn't an ex expert in computer security will need to get through that long and complicated process we've seen in the OTR case to understand the tools and master they use and regain their right to privacy. And the crypto guy party guys are putting a lot of effort in dealing with these websites and shitty, sh um, shitty tools. Um, this, what I showed you before, is from the crypto party wiki. And it shows pretty well how crypto party people approach training. Um, it's very detailed, maybe a little bit too much, and probably totally overwhelming for a beginner. And it's not appealing at all. And the result is that at a crypto party, you have self-claimed experts. Some of them are really good, some of them less, who explain very complicated tools, mostly with very poor user experience, to people who don't really understand what they're doing and why they're learning it, and who probably will not be secure because they don't understand it, and because the crypto party people are tech people who talk like tech people who talk to tech people. Um, and the best result that you can get out of it is probably to make someone paranoid or thinking they're safe and being unsafe. Um, paranoid, a good example is that we got this um, journalist who came at crypto parties, and he was this very normal journalist, hipster, Berlin guy with uh, a MacBook and an iPhone, and he came to a crypto party because he was doing some research, and he um, started taking this very, very seriously, and he hung out with very paranoid crypto party guys, and after, I think, two or three months, he had an offline computer. He had no iPhone anymore. He was running Tails, an operating, a secure operating system. He had a dumb phone instead. And then he disappeared. And he, got, he bought a new MacBook, and he didn't show up at crypto parties again. And then he wrote an article about it, um, how it was too hard and how he would not manage. Um, then he restarted using PGP, I had to retrain him. Um, that's the kind of stuff that happens at crypto parties. And I know people are doing their best there, but that's the reality of things. And let's be honest, crypto party will never scale. That's another point. It's a tiny band-aid on a giant wound. You have massive uh, mass surveillance. Um, and we have like maybe 100 to 200 people in the world who are like, we're going to train everyone on privacy. And let's assume 20 people come at each crypto party. I'm very generous with that. I've seen a lot of smaller crypto parties than that, but there is some big ones, so maybe we can consider it's 20. Um, I've counted yesterday that in 2017, um, 300 crypto party happened exactly. Um, so we can assume that around 6,000 people have been trained if we consider everyone only came one time, which is not a reality either. Um, 
I'll let you do the math. Um, how many years before encryption is the norm? And then you have the other approach, which is saying this is all too complicated. We're just going to give people Signal and Tor and no proper training. This use Signal, use Tor. Um, that is very popular in America after Trump, and you'll be fine. Um, so the question is, um, you have the choice between teaching strong encryption, knowing that the person will probably give up on it tomorrow because they just learned it and it was fun, but they lost the password they made anyway and they don't remember how to use it, and the updates didn't work, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or you teach something less secure that people will understand and remember how to use and help them increase their privacy. What's the best solution? Um, I don't believe there is one answer to that. The answer is that we need to see further than the kind of training that's endlessly done without thinking a crypto party, just giving people PGP, letting them go. Get a, giving new people PGP, letting them go. Um, and I think there is need to be more than that. Um, it's time to see further than crypto party. There's two kinds of needs, basically. There is people who want to protect their privacy. These are the people who went to a crypto party after Snowden. Um, they care about their privacy. They have the right to encrypt. Um, and they should learn it in some way. And then there is the people who need serious help. I'm talking about journalists, activists, minorities. And Crypto Party is failing at helping both groups because it's trying to do some in-between things where it doesn't help enough for the people who have serious needs and helps too much for the people who just want to have some fun learning something that could protect them a little bit. And the goal is that we should be able to scale. And um, by doing that in-between thing and losing time, resources, energy, we're not going to get to that point. We need to focus on training people who actually need training, uh, the journalists and NGOs and activists, minorities. And we need to communicate somehow with users about what they actually need and also inform programmers about what people need because we can be an interface between both. We need to think more in terms of threat model. What does a person want to protect themselves from or need to protect themselves from? Which contexts are they in? What does a person need to, in order to protect themselves? And depending on that, we need to give people different and adapted training. I'm not saying that crypto party is bad, um, but we need to understand that crypto party should be there for specific cases only, people who want to protect their privacy and not for the journalists, activists, etc. And for that, crypto party needs to adapt to the basic knowledge that people have and not assume they can all go through PGP and a Linux install in three hours. Um, and they also need to understand the real needs of people who are in danger, who really need help. I've seen a lot of people who are real activists come to crypto parties because they had no other solution for help and being trained like as a hobby, not very seriously, that's very dangerous. Um, and um, we need to set up other structures. There is some, but for like real training, there is some of them that do great work, but they're too local and they have too much of a limited action. Um, we need local trainers that are available to go everywhere and not only in Berlin and San Francisco and maybe New York. Um, we need um, some options around trainings and workshops for those who don't need advanced training or those who need advanced training but don't have access to trainers. Um, if you know someone in this situation, the best option is probably to contact some organizations like CIJ or Tactical Tech or at least give them good tutorials and not some random BuzzFeed tutorial. Um, I really recommend uh, the YouTube channel um, Infosec Bytes. It's probably one of the best encryption tutorials out there and it's very recent, so it's very up to date. Um, they do great work. Um, and if it comes to training people with no special needs, everyone can help. Tell people around you that you want to use Signal and co to communicate. That's a really good start, getting everyone on Signal. And don't use Telegram or something, really use Signal. 
And if you have possibility to take such a decision, uh, make people around you encrypt. That can be done in the family, for example, by asking people to use encryption with you. Um, but also um, at companies, if you have the power to take a decision that everyone should encrypt in your company, you can do that because people are more able or more willing to learn stuff if they feel like it's part of their job and they adapt new tools better, if they feel like they have to and they're paid for it. And if you're not able to take that decision for your company, you could at least advocate for it. Um, or I guess there is a bunch of programmers here. If you think that is more useful, you can make some more of these um, maybe secure phone messengers. Um, you can have an ego trip and make your own instead of being helpful. And you can hope that some crypto party guy will decide to train your messenger and you can be really proud of it. If you think that's more useful, do it. I have a little bit of time left for questions, I think. And also one announcement, there is a crypto party I don't like calling it a crypto party, but people still want to call it a crypto party. Um, I'm doing it on my own, so it's written that it's going to last for two days. I'm not going to do two days of crypto party. I am a human. I need some fresh air at some point. Um, so I'll be there every day at um, just after lunch and again two hours later, and I'll see if someone is there and wants to learn about crypto. Or you can just find me and ask me, and we can go to the workshop room together. Or DM me on Twitter. Um, and if you have any questions about crypto, you can also come to me privately. Questions? Um, so the question was, how many people did I get to use crypto in the past years? Um, it's hard to estimate. I've not counted. I've um, done a lot of lessons at journalism universities, um, which is one target audience I've done. I guess I've trained 200 journalists or something like this. Um, I've been at crypto parties, I've trained a bunch of probably several hundred people at crypto parties as well. The crypto parties I've been at probably have trained at least a thousand or two thousand people by now. And the conferences, groups I was part of. Um, it's hard to estimate which people still use crypto because like, that's the important thing. Um, I have two different approaches. With people who just come to a crypto party because they want, um, I don't really care if they keep using it because it's their problem. I try to teach them as well as I can, but I cannot force them. With journalists, the idea is not that they're going to keep using crypto. The idea is that they know what it is just in case they have a source coming to them and then they can go back to it because I know they're going to be lazy. I have a few journalists that still encrypt. They go to crypto parties after that. It's really nice, but most of them are not turned to crypto. But if they need it, they'll know it. And at the crypto parties, I can't, I can't know. But definitely a few, I think I've trained like 1,000 to 2,000 people, something like that. Yeah. Hi. What's your answer to the people who says, I have nothing to hide? Um, I have a one-hour lecture on that. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm not going to do that now. Um, there is different reasons. I, I used to say I have nothing to hide. Some guys invited me to a crypto party and I said, I have nothing to hide. It's like, I don't know about computers. This is too complicated for me. I studied literature. It's like, I'm not a techie. And um, the guy actually managed to convince me because he told me that some people need crypto and if only they use crypto, then they'll like, be like red flags or something. And if everyone uses crypto, even people who have nothing to hide, then the people really need it. And I knew people need it, like minorities and journalists and activists. Um, then these people will um, um, be hidden by my use of crypto. And I think that's one of the good reasons to get people to encrypt, not for themselves, but for the general public, like the people who need it. For the rest, um, there is giving them examples of surveillance, showing them some tools um, about like 
how tracking works, like trackography by tactical tech, like how many trackers are there on the newspapers that you read, stuff like that sometimes works. Talking to them about the future, what will happen in the future with your data, things can change politically. And um, the data that I post now, for example, I say I like blue. And maybe in 20 years, there is a dictator that says people who like blue are bad. Like that's happened in history, not with liking blue, but with random factors. And if I said it now in the future, it's going to be stored and it's going to be something against me. How can I know what's relevant to my future and not? That's a few of the arguments. There is some more, but more questions? There. There is one more question. Is there? Uh, thank you. Hello. Uh, have you thought of one other possible vector to influence people, and that is uh, cryptocurrency? It is all over the news now. It's not theoretical. It concerns them financially, and it doesn't depend on political orientation. Everybody wants to secure their uh, bitcoins, their wallets, their operating systems. Yeah, so um, Crypto Party doesn't do anything cryptocurrency related. There is other groups who do that. Um, it's all a relevant topic too, but I think Crypto Party people being volunteers don't want to get into um, advising people about what to do with their money because that's a pretty weird thing to do if you just like, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of a weird thing to do, to just randomly tell people you should invest in this or this and you don't know the people and how much money they have. It's, it's pretty risky. And also, it's more about crypto parties, more about encrypting communications in general. That doesn't make it less relevant, it's just different groups doing it. Any more questions? Well, then it's stickers time. Thanks.